what? <laughs> it's not weird. You're weird. You'd be doing this too if you were this excited to finally have the concrete top sitting on the vanity that we built in the last video and it took this long to get it in place. I'm excited for it. It's awesome. It turned out fantastic. But in all seriousness, I'm going to show you how I built the top, all the trials and tribulations I had with it, how to finish it, how to hang the sink, and everything today. Check it out. Well, the first place we got to start on any concrete project is we got to make a mold. So that's going to be cut out of three quarter inch melamine. Now I've shown this lots before. There's a bunch of reasons for using it, but my side walls, I'm going to cut at two inches because I want my main slab. So the inside dimension of my mold to be an inch and a quarter. And then I'm also making a backsplash at seven eighths of an inch thick. So I'm cutting the side walls for that guy at an inch and five eighths. Then to attach the sidewalls to the mold, I'm just using an eighth inch drill bit to pre-drill. You definitely want to pre-drill so it doesn't swell the melamine. Then I'm attaching some inch and five eighths long drywall screws. Now, the reason I'm using drywall screws is they're very thin, but they're super coarse. So it's really good for grabbing onto the chipboard inside of the melamine. Now, oh boy, do I hope you bought a sink already because <laughs> in the box, well, hopefully in the box, there should be a template like this. Now, I'm going to cut my template out and this is what we're actually going to cut the knockout for our sink from. Now, the knockout itself is just going to be cut out of pink rigid uh, home insulation that you can find at any big box store. Uh, it's really plentiful, really easy to find, and it cuts super easy and it resists the weight of the concrete really well. You can go ahead and cut this however you want, either on or off camera. Clearly I was started cutting it off camera, but however you want to do it, that's entirely up to you. Now spend a little time here making sure you get your knockout exactly how you want it. I put a half inch round over bit in my router rounded over all my corners and then went back with a sanding sponge and cleaned the entire thing up because the concrete will simulate exactly what this knockout ends up looking like so make sure you get it pretty well perfect then to seal up the edges i'm just using clear packing tape but again making sure there's no wrinkles in it because they will show and then for our faucet knockout it's just a piece of abs pipe that i found at the hardware store that was pretty much the exact dimension that i needed Then we can silicone the mold. I'm gonna use a white 100% kitchen and bath silicone. Now this is going to be because I'm adding a white pigment to my concrete, but if you were adding a charcoal pigment, you may wanna use black silicone. Then we can take these cake fondant ball tools, choose the one with the correct little round over that you like, and then we can start wiping off our silicone. Now I've shown lots before that you can use your finger, but fingers are squishy. And people tend to have an imperfect pattern and pressure when they're pushing on it, and it doesn't leave the best rounded corner. These fondant ball tools will give you a perfectly uniform finish all the way around and it's probably the best option you can have. Then once you've gone over the entire thing, just go back a couple more times to clean everything up. Alrighty, now with our concrete molds basically assembled, waxed, silicone, they're drying, and our knockouts finished, now we can start adding our knockouts to the mold. But it's not quite as simple as just adding them into the center, squaring them up and calling it a day. It's a bunch of stuff we gotta be aware of. On the leading edge, we have to be aware we have a half inch overhang, plus we have the thickness of our doors, plus we have the thickness of our top stretcher. Then we have to leave a gap, and then in front of the knockout itself, you gotta remember we're using an undermount sink. So there's an inch and a half flange that runs all the way around we have to account for as well. And then on the back side, we also have to account for our backsplash. Another thing, my vanity is gonna be pushed up against to one wall. It's not gonna be centered, but I want my sink to be centered with the doors on the vanity. But the measurements are pretty simple. All right, now one of our first measurements we're gonna need is the, the basic size of the sink, including the flange. This way we can figure out the size of our flange. The best idea you can do is actually just take and measure your entire sink. So mine is actually 14 by 20. Then what we can do is measure our insert here for our knockout for the sink and I've got 17 by 11. Now obviously that'll use me three inches all the way around so I split that into two for each side so an inch and a half flange all the way around that I have to account for. 
Now armed with that knowledge, I can come over to the vanity. Now I know I've got a half inch overhang in front of my cabinet doors. So to the back side of my door here is going to be two inches. So now I can take two inches. I want one inch between my flange and my stretcher here. So that will put me at three inches. Then I've got an inch and a half flange. So about four and a half inches is about where I want my knockout to be. Now I'm going to shrink that back to four and a quarter. That'll just give me three quarters of an inch gap here between where my flange will end up and my stretcher right there. Then I need to figure out the center of my doors because that's where the center of my sink knockout is going to be. And my entire cabinet itself is 29 and a half inches. So 14 and three quarters puts me at the center of my doors. All right, now what we need to do is take and mark a center line on our knockout. Now I've got 17 inches, so eight and a half inches is my center line. Just a tiny little dot. And we can set this guy down. Now we're just gonna rough in our setback. Four and a quarter, wow, that was pretty close. Oh my God, that was pretty well bang on. Okay, it's four and a quarter. That's my setback now, just kind of roughed in. Now I can center this guy up. Now if you are just building this and you've got an even overhang all the way around, you're centering it up quick and easy. But because I am building this one side against the wall and the other side is gonna have an overhang and I want my sink to be centered with the cabinet doors and not the top itself, I have to do a little bit of math here. Now, we gotta remember that we're building this inverted right now. It's reverse cast. So what's actually on my left side right now is what's going to be against the wall. And what's on my right side right now, once we pop this out of the mold, is what's actually gonna have my overhang on the left side. I need to pull my 14 and three quarter inch measurement, which is half my cabinet to the center of the doors off the left side because that's what's going to be against the wall once I pop this out of the mold. So at 14 and three quarters, make a mark on the mold. Then we can line up the mark on our knockout to the mark on the mold. And we should have half inch difference between our measurements. So I've got six and three quarters and six and a quarter, which is exactly what I want it to be. Now my sink is actually offset to the one side, which is closer to the wall. That way when I flip this over, it's gonna be centered on the doors. And this side is gonna have a half inch larger because it's gonna be overhanging the cabinet, which is eventually going to be my right side. Whew, now that that's all figured out, we can center the faucet knockout to the sink knockout itself. That way the two of them are centered. Just remember to leave that inch and a half gap between the two of them for the sink flange. Then just glue them to the mold using the same silicone we used before. Now for the sink knockout, I used the same roundover tool that I used on the rest of the mold, but for the faucet, I used one of the smallest ones I had because I didn't want a sharp edge, but I don't need a very big transition because it's gonna be hiding underneath the faucet anyway. Then after a couple hours, go ahead and start peeling up all the tails, not the roundover parts, the little tails that you push to the side. And if they don't wanna just peel up nicely, a razor blade just held flat against the mold will score them up and they'll just peel right up easily. Reinforcement time. Now, if you're using a fiberglass reinforcement, skip this step altogether. I'm not, fiberglass is hard to find, it's expensive here, blah, blah, blah. This is stuff is awesome. It's readily available at pretty much any big box store in the concrete aisle itself, and it's used for parging on the outside of your house. Now, I like it because on a small project like this, it's got a really, really high density uh, of wire in there for the concrete to grab onto because it's wound so tightly and it cuts really easily with tin snips It's just dummy sharp So you probably want to wear gloves honestly when you do this Just make sure to leave about three quarters of an inch to an inch gap around all of your knockouts and edges So it doesn't shadow through and flatten any burrs once you're done cutting it Okay, failed concrete slabs time. Now, I'm just gonna breeze over these, but I will tell you what went wrong. The first thing was I assumed that Mixer was doing a lot better job at mixing it. I clearly needed to mix it longer because I ended up having some kind of dry spots that never really got mixed in very well, and I didn't notice until I demolded. Another problem I had was this is the first time I used a dry pigment in there and it ended up absorbing a lot of the water. I mixed this concrete basically to spec with the correct amount of water that I needed and it wasn't flowing out no matter how much I vibrated. I even put a little bit of extra water in there and that was my first clue that something was off and as soon as I demolded it came true. I had massive air voids all over the place because they wouldn't come out because the mix was just way too thick 
and I also had just tiny little pinholes all over the face of it because it wasn't mixed well enough. So armed with that knowledge, it was on to slab number two. I added more water to the mix hoping to alleviate that issue and I ended up vibrating it kind of a little bit harder and I mixed it a lot longer and it was looking good until I flipped it over and I still had all the bug holes aplenty but they were a lot smaller but a problem I had was my melamine ended up absorbing some water and it had this really weird wavy pattern to it and it just was not good. So slab number three with a new melamine mold. And honestly, this one was the best one I had yet. It was serviceable if I had to use it. Bug holes were a lot smaller and there were a lot less of them. The face was pretty good, but this time I knew there was a better way. So I bought a couple extra things and had at it again. Now this time we're gonna be doing a multi-stage pour. We're gonna pour backer coat as well as a face coat and we're going to start by pre-mixing our dry pigment and water. This helps ensure that we don't have any dry spots of pigment. I'm also going to mix my concrete in stages a little bit at a time to make sure it gets thoroughly mixed in. Then I'm going to add a little bit of flow control. You may be able to find this at your home improvement store in the concrete aisle. Uh, if not, you can buy it online. I had to get it online, but you notice it's releasing the tension in the concrete. I haven't added any more water and it kind of takes it from peanut butter to cake batter, a nice flowable mix. And you'll know it's good when it can fall off the trowel, but yet a layer of it will still stick at the same time. Now this is what I was going for, a nice pourable mix. From here, we're just gonna rod the concrete, which is basically just poking and prodding it with your fingers hundreds and hundreds of times, all over the face of it, along the corners of it, in the edges, along the knockouts, everywhere. We're also gonna pull it up along the sides. Now this will ensure that this entire face coat is going to look fantastic. Now this is what we're gonna do in place of vibrating is all of this rotting, as well as a little bit of compaction with a chip brush. Just basically brush it out and this helps pop as many bubbles as possible. Then we can let that dry for about 20 minutes to half an hour and we're going to mix our backer coat and this is mixed exactly the same way as the face coat. Not gonna lie, a little stressed out here. All right, moment of truth. Oh, yes, finally, oh man. Woo, that looks fantastic. Oh, all right, let's keep going. Oh, that is perfect. <laughs> All right, now we're getting dangerously close. We gotta finish this guy out. So we're gonna start by polishing the underside. I got these wet concrete diamond polishing pads here. Now they usually go on a buffer, but they work perfectly fine in my sander. I'm gonna use the 50 to grind off the entire underside lip around the entire perimeter, as well as around the sink knockout. And I just keep checking my work as I go to make sure everything's nice and flat. Then once it was all good, I generally flattened the center of the slab. Then I went back with a 100 and a 200, just to give everything a nice smooth finish on the underside. Now when it comes to polishing the top, we're not going to go very far with it. It's already very smooth straight out of the molds. I want to keep it that way. So I'm just going to use some 600 grit wet sandpaper on a sanding sponge and I'm just going to go back and forth in long straight lines, putting very light pressure on the slab. You'll sort of feel the sandpaper sort of release and just let go and there will be no more tension on it and it slides nicely and that's how you know you're done. Then just clean up the corners and the sides. 
Once it's dry, we can go ahead and fill any small little bug holes that are remaining with our slurry mix. Yeah, it wasn't perfect out of the mold, but that's what this is for. It's Portland cement, some of our pigment, a 50-50 mix of water and acrylic fortifier mixed to about toothpaste. Now the acrylic fortifier is going to help the slurry stick to the cured slab. Now you're going to want to work in small sections, about a quarter of the slab at a time, and work it in very small circles with your hand and pushing pretty aggressively. You want to force it down into there. Along the corners, pinch your fingers together and force it into any bug holes around the edges. Then let it dry for only about five minutes and come back with a rubber handed glove and wipe it off. It'll ball up and peel right back. I found this is the best way to do it because if you actually let it dry for a few hours and wet sand it, you'll end up actually hydrating some of the slurry again and removing it from some of the bigger holes. That's the best option. Then just come back after a few hours with that. Use a blue Scotch-Brite pad from the kitchen, just slightly dampened with water and remove the top slurry haze. And that's it, you're done. Wipe it off, dry it. Time for sealer and time for wax. Now we can finally put our vanity and our top in place and it looks fantastic, but we still got to attach a sink. So to clean everything up for on the bottom side where the flange is going to be, just use some rubbing alcohol and then we got to glue the sink into place. Now I'm just going to put some transparent no more nails in each corner, about a quarter inch tall bead, and then fill in the gaps between the adhesive with some kitchen and bath transparent silicone. Again, about a quarter inch bead. Then using a clamp with a removable head, we're going to use that to pull up against a 2x4 so the sink is in place. Then just kind of wrestle it around, push and pull, and adjust all of your reveals until everything feels good and everything's about even. Then just let it dry for a day or so until the glue's dry. With it glued in place, we just got to make sure it's waterproof. So from the inside, again, using the same transparent silicone, we can just go back and add another layer underneath and then wipe it clean. It doesn't have to worry about it being too pretty, but make sure it closes that gap and that is it. Add your accessories, add another layer of silicone everywhere the concrete meets the wall just to seal it up and finish it out. And that is it. So I hope you guys liked the video. I hope you liked the project and I hope you may have learned something from my mistakes <laughs> along the way. Maybe save yourself some money. But it's a really cool project because it's infinitely customizable. You can design this with whatever sink, shape, size you want as well as any colors and the size of the concrete top that you need. So I hope you guys like it. If you do, let me know. Otherwise, thanks for watching you guys. I'll see you in the next one.